Namaste. Welcome to my discussion. Now, you might wonder what all this shit's about, right? Well, the glasses, the rainbow mask. It's so that this is not all about me. I'm just another person, just like you, just like anybody else. And so, by doing this, it just gives you kind of an anonymous figure to look at. And it doesn't make it so much about me, because I don't want this to be about me. That's where things become a problem, when it becomes about us individually, and not us all together. <clears throat> so, here's the deal. I've spent a lot of time in my life searching for something more than myself, and I believe that that started when I was born. You know, I believe that we all come into this world with problems that we have to work on. It's our karma. So, here's the deal. You come into this world and you bring these problems. Well, why did you have these problems to bring in with? So, let's go back to the beginning for a minute. The solar panel talked about, in his post, the Bible. And um, I, I did study the Bible extensively. Uh, I've studied the Bhagavad Gita. I've studied a little bit of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism. I've studied a lot of different ideologies around the world and did uh, objective comparisons with it. And I think that's, that's a necessary thing. Um, so, what got me to the point where I started looking at everything? Well, you know, we get in rock and hard places and then we want to look for answers. We want to look for something greater than ourselves. And, you know, it's pretty much true with all of us. And so there I was in between that rock and a hard place. And, you know, for many, many years, I, I was of the mindset that, that I, I could look around me into this world. And I knew instinctively that all of this around me is just not the result of a bunch of random coincidences. There has to be something more that guides it. But what that was, I don't know. I didn't know. Who does? You know? And so, so you know, mostly we're kind of brought up into the, the mindset of our parents or our society or whatever. And... I found that humanity doesn't like to uh, look look much past their own perspective. It's it's just like, well, this is my perspective. I'm going to stick with it and don't need to change it. Well, I found that, that I have to question my own perspective every day. Because I don't know everything. And, you know, tomorrow... There might come some evidence that I didn't see before that could turn that whole perspective around. It's called objectivity. Okay? It's being objective. Looking at things without a predetermined belief of how they are. So, let me get back, back to, to, to the story here. So, I'm in a rock and a hard place. And so, I believe it's my last chance to find God. So, where would somebody in America start looking for God in the first place? That's right. I started reading the Bible. The problem was, is the more I read it, the more confused I got. And it was just a problem, you know? And so, here, 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 here's where I came to a breaking point. I was reading the Bible, and I came across Genesis 6.6. 6. And if you don't know what it says, it, it pretty much just says that God was grieved that he made mankind on the face of the earth. Now, I'm a deep thinker, and I started to contemplate that. And I asked myself this one very important question. Why would a being that knows all things ever make a group of people he knew he was going to have to destroy before they he ever made them. You, you kind of get the point. For God to be all-knowing, he would have had to know 
how bad mankind would be and that he would eventually have to destroy them. So why are you going to make something that you know you're going to have to destroy? So, so that led me to asking other people about that. And nobody could really answer that question. Other Christians, preachers, nobody. And so, so I came to the conclusion that, 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 that there's only one thing to do. I had two choices. I could give up, or I could just ask God to teach me, which I did. Okay, and so when I prayed and asked God to teach me, it was quite interesting because I started pondering things and I started to see things a little bit differently. For instance, one day I sat and I was considering the question of the glass being half full or half empty. And then this, this awesome truth came to me. That the glass is really always full. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The glass is always full. How? Well, see this cup here? It's got coffee in it. It's, it's much higher than the halfway mark. But in reality, if I turn that cup upside down, it's still going to be full. The cup is always full, and the reason why it is always full is because there's a measure of air in it. And air is a substance, it has weight, it has mass, and it takes up space. The problem is, is we don't see it, so we never bothered to calculate it into the question, did we? And that kind of leads us on to an even deeper subject, the subject called darkness. <clears throat> Now, many of us believe that there's this thing called light and this thing called darkness, day and night. But, but you see, that's just not true. Let me explain it to you. In reality, darkness does not exist. Now, how do we know this? Well, we have a whole lot of visible light that we call day. And then there's a whole lot of invisible light, like gamma rays, x-rays, infrared, ultraviolet, that we can't see. So the reality of the situation is that darkness is simply just an illusion of your limited sense of sight. So, here we go. A and it gets deeper. So, so as my perspective changed, you know, I, I, I began to think of things like this. Well, if you ask any Christian, they will agree with you that God is omnipresent. Okay, so then, define omnipresent for me. Well, omnipresent means everywhere, present, everywhere, present. Now, name me one thing that's not part of everywhere, and then you'll realize that there's nothing but God. <laughs> so, and, and so that leads us to, to this here. There was another question besides the the Noah's Ark thing in the flood about destroying man that he knew. I'm going to give you an analogy because I like analogies and metaphors. <clears throat> Let's imagine that you've got a room full of two-year-olds, okay, and you've got a low-level coffee table there, and you take a tray of these awesome goodies, and you stick it on that low-lying coffee table in front of the two-year-olds. And then you tell the two-year-olds, if they touch the goodies, you're going to smack them in the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, it's a rough analogy, I know. But, but consider what I'm, I'm saying here. Do you put a snack tray full of goodies in front of a two-year-old and tell them not to touch it when you know good and well they're going to in the first place? So the question lies, why do you put a tree in front of people when you don't want them to eat it? You know they're going to eat it. Why would you do this? Well, let's go back a little bit further in the beginning. And then there's something that said, let there be light. Okay. Now, if you go further into Genesis, you'll find out that God hadn't even created the sun and the moon yet. So what was that light? Well, in ancient times, believe it or not, <laughs> Light and darkness were used um, as, as metaphorical language. If you had understanding, if you had awareness, you were a child of the light. 
if you did not have awareness or understanding, you could be considered a child of the darkness. You can't see, you don't understand, you don't comprehend. Let there be light in the darkness, could not comprehend, understand. What was that light? Awareness? Consciousness? Us? So, what did God use to create all of this but the essence of its own beingness? And if God is omnipresent, then there's nothing but God, so that would feed into to what Jesus was trying to teach people when he told them, Your Father! Your Father! So, so Jesus kept telling people, Your Father, he, he pretty much gave credit for everything he did to His Father. So the question is, is why are people giving him credit for doing those things today? Yes, Jesus was God. But so are you. God is omnipresent. What is there that isn't God? Now then, let's go back to, to the tree for a minute. Why would a creator put that tree there in the first place? Well, you're God, so to speak. But, and I mean, let me define it differently. I was waiting for, for 100% disability from the VA last year, and I got it in December of last year, 2017. While I was waiting, me and a friend of mine, we, we talked about getting an RV and doing some camping trips and such, and we fantasized about all the details and stuff, and we, we had a pretty good idea of what we wanted to do. Well, I ended up leaving the friend behind because he wouldn't, uh, you know, put forth the effort needed, you know, to get things done. The one thing, though, that I didn't realize was the $700 it was going to cost in gas to get my RV from Montana down to Arizona and then to California. I didn't have any clue about that $700 until I got in that rig and I actually drove it. And I experienced it for myself. Then I have understanding. So, so the reality is, is how can you really understand the consequences of your choices if you don't have experience? And so, so think about it. Let's go back to Adam and Eve for a minute in the tree. Okay. So there's a hidden moral to that story that many people miss. Here it is. First of all. People back then understood two things. One, when God asked Adam and Eve, what did you do? This is a metaphor now. The hearer of the story knew that Adam and Eve were busted, that God knew. They, he, they knew that, that God knew. They, he didn't need Adam and Eve to tell him what they did. You get, get what I'm saying? The hero of the story also realized another thing. Adam and Eve should have known they were busted. I mean, when your pops comes up to you and says, What did you do? Come on, man, you kind of know you're screwed. So, so in the story, what happened was when God asked, What did you do? The woman, she tried to blame the devil, a.k.a. the serpent. Now, before we continue, let me ask you this question. How well did that work out for Eve, her trying to blame the devil for her actions? It didn't, did it? Now, see, see the Christian church is really funny because they want to try to, to peg Eve as the bigger sinner of the story. <laughs> Eve just blamed the devil, a.k.a. the serpent. Adam, he said, the woman you made me, you gave me. So she not only blamed the devil, which was a.k.a. Eve, in his situation, he also blamed God. Who made her for him? Isn't that something? You see the metaphor to that? When something goes bad, we don't want to take responsibility for our actions. We try to blame somebody else. And we even go so far as blaming God. God, why did you do this to me? So, 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 see, there's, there's a moral to that story. When you're busted in your wrongdoing, you should, you know, stand up to it and 
take care of the business. It's when you try to lie, pass the bug, play the blame game, that's where shit gets fucked up. That's what that story is trying to tell you. When you get caught in your shit, fess up. How would that story have turned out if Eve said, You know what, God, you told me not to eat that fruit, but I did anyway. But then you still got to ask that question. Why did an all-knowing being put that tree in front of them people knowing they were going to eat it in the first place? Unless it's something that was necessary. How do you learn if you don't experience? And that's what karma is all about. So, let me give you some insight about me real quick. It's quite interesting, actually. Um, I lived in California up until 1978. Now, to get into this, you know, I'm going to tell you, I, I dip a little bit into numerology. Okay? And so... If you take my birthday and add it up, it equals 6. Well, first it'll equal 33, then 6. Okay, and so in 78, 7 plus 8 is 15, 1 plus 5 equals 6. See? In 1978, I was actually 15. 1 plus 5 equals 6. And um, we were getting ready to move from California with my stepdad's boss. Uh, they were moving the business somewhere. We didn't know where. My stepdad, he looked at a lot of property in different places. And interestingly enough, we got a package from Montana one day. And I looked at the pictures of a mountain and a pine tree. And I just, I just, there's something about it. I just wanted to go live there. I don't know what that draw was. It might have been Grizzly Adams. Who knows? We, we moved to Oklahoma instead. Lived there for two years, and then 1980, we moved to Texas and the Gulf Coast. 1981, I was 18. Get that? 81 and 18? Same number backwards. Oh, that's, that's not the whole... I was 20... I turned 29 on the 29th in 92. Hmm. Interesting things with numbers, right? So, so... I get to Texas, I joined the Navy in, in uh, 81 when I'm 18, and and I, I see the world, you know, Japan, Okinawa, Philippines, Spain, Italy, Egypt. Yeah, I could have seen the pyramids, but I was too interested in finding the beer. That's what you call young and dumb, right? So I get out of the Navy, go back to Texas, meet a girl, we shack up for about a month and a, month and a half. I'm bipolar, so I've never really been good at keeping a job. I'm more up here thinking all the time. So she split up with me, and I went on a little road trip and did some really weak LSD. It, it wasn't really strong stuff. It'd make ripples on the wall. I'd see a little ultraviolet light, but nothing really heavy duty, you know? No melting faces or all that, blah, blah, blah. Well, I I did that for about a month, and then after I'd stopped, I had a dream. It was a very vivid dream. My girlfriend, she came to me in the town square, and she had a baby in her arms. Man, it was the happiest dream I ever had, and you just don't know how disappointed I was when I woke up in that morning and realized it was just a dream, because being a father has been one of my biggest wishes. So, four months later, I'm back in Texas, back, back, back where we met, and I find out that she's back with the guy that she was living with before me, and she's four months pregnant. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, I try to find out, but no dice. I think she knows it's mine, but telling him it's his. So, she ends up having her baby in Galveston, Texas in 1986. Okay? So, that same year, I'm, I'm laying in the bed in Bay City, Texas, trying to practice self-hypnosis. I'm lying there breathing, and the next thing I know, I'm on a grassy hill walking. I'm just walking on this grassy hill, and then I turn to look behind me, and I'm somebody else. That somebody else was a cavalry officer sitting on a horse. As I'm looking up, I see this creek or some water. And then as I'm looking further across, there's this Native American with a, a, a gun. And he shoots. And the minute he shoots, I'm 
I'm, I'm about that bad, just a uh, uh, full awareness. It was just so vivid and freaky, you know. For a long, long time, I thought I was having a past life vision of being a cavalry officer. You know. Uh, let's fast forward 20 years. Um, I always thought that I'd never, never really know if that kid was mine. She had a daughter in 1986 in Galveston, Texas. 20 years later, I did a free people search in 2007. Found my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Name, number, everything for free. And um, my daughter really didn't need a DNA test. <laughs> yeah, she looked a lot like me when she was young. Um, but, but, that's still strained. The interesting part is, is where I found her. When I found my daughter born in Galveston, Texas, I found her 55 miles from where the Battle of Little Bighorn took place in Montana. Now note, in 78 I saw pictures of Montana and wanted to live there. In 86, I have a vision of being a cavalry officer shot by an Indian. And then I find my daughter, 55 miles from Little Bighorn, and she was born the same year I have this vision. That's kind of freaky, isn't it? Oh, well, like I said, for for quite a long time, I, I, I believed that that was a past life vision of being a cavalry officer shot by an Indian. There's a guy named Daniel Brinkley. Daniel Brinkley, um, in, in the 80s, was, was hit by electricity through a phone in a lightning storm. Uh, it's claimed he was dead for 20 minutes. And in his li uh, life review, he said that, that he saw everything he did to the people's eyes that he did it to. And I kind of held on to that for quite a while, but it, it really didn't click until, until later on. Um... Jesus says the measure you use will be measured back to you. And, and so if you think about that, what better way to measure your actions towards other people than to see your actions through the eyes of those that you do it to? You reap what you sow, right? The measure you use. Okay, so, so we do live in a world of cause and effect, and this is the one thing that I've learned. Cause and effect, uh, you know. In Buddhism, they talk about you. The the purpose of this life is to get out of the reincarnation cycle, you know. And, and I found a lot of good stuff in Buddhism, but but with every religion, I found that there's some things I can agree with, and some things I got to disagree with. And you know, for me to to honestly believe that I came into this body with the sole purpose of getting out of the reincarnation cycle. Why would I get into it in the first place if if the sole purpose was just to get out? Huh? Maybe the purpose of this life is to learn. Learn from our mistakes. Think about this. On that other side, we're all connected. We don't have to speak. We think with bah. So, Jesus gives us a clue in, in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so look, you have power in you, just like I have power in me. How are you using that power? That's the question. Is it self-serving? Are you doing it just for you? Or do you have a greater picture in mind? See, one of my goals is to help younger generations, you know, people to understand that, that, that there's a good possibility that reincarnation is real. And so, if you consider that reincarnation is real, you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to be born onto this planet again, what kind of world do I want to be born into? We'll start today to make that world. All we do is sit on our asses and complain about how things are. We live in a country that's supposed to be government for the people, by the people, and yet these so-called people have yet to stand up to their government and tell them taking my neighbor's land is wrong. Sometimes you have to reject some things in the Bible, like when Paul says obey authority, because authority was instilled by God. 
Well, sometimes you have to question authority because did God instill Hitler? Did God instill Stalin? Did God instill the authority of all the brutal dictators in history? I think not. Maybe those people got there to give us the chance to say, hey, looky here, oh, we don't want this. What power are we using to make the world we want, or a better world? But it's not about what we want. It's about the collective and humanity. All right, so, so look. I was reading in one of them posts about forgiveness. Somebody commented the solar panel about about forgiveness and love. And and you know I I've got to say karma. That is that is how you escape karma, forgiveness, and love, because you reap what you sow. The measure you use will be measured back to you. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. If you show mercy, you'll be shown mercy. It's all about what you do and how you treat your fellow man. And if you don't think we have to answer for what we do in this life, you're sadly mistaken. That's why we have to come back and work on things because we didn't really fully understand what we did to that person. So now we've got to walk a little bit in their shoes to really know. Hmm. It wasn't until I did Ayahuasca on the solstice of 2016 that I came to the realization about that vision I had in 1986. Oh, and by the way, 8 plus 6 is what? 14? 1 plus 9 is 10, so 1 plus 5 is 6. 1986 equals 6, 2. So, anyway, the truth of the matter was, is, is in 2008, I went to uh, Montana, picked up my first Native American flute, and you heard me playing this little Cherokee whistle for a bit. But it wasn't until after that ayahuasca ceremony that I began to realize something. I wasn't a cavalry officer. I was the Indian that shot him, and I was looking at my actions through his eyes. You see, I firmly believe that, that, that we've missed something. The, the, the natives had something that, that we really need to get back, living in harmony with our environment. You see? The natives had the same problem that we have today. They, they were doing good, living in their environment, they weren't wasteful, they kept the area clean, they picked, you, you get what I'm saying. Their problem is that they fought with each other like everybody else does. Just think, if they had banded together back then to fight with each other, they could not have been divided and conquered. We lost that ability to live in harmony with our environment as we became more modern. Maybe that was necessary, because we have technology today that we could live in a cleaner world. You see, you see many people breaking their necks, working their fingers to the bone to stock up all these material things for their kids. Oh, I want to leave my kids all this. I want to leave my kids all that. Well, you know, and, and <laughs> did you bother to stop to think that maybe those children might need a planet to enjoy all those material things on? And um, in your mad dash, you just said, fuck the planet, you know, let's get it all today, and Fuck tomorrow. Well, what if you're going to be born into this world again? You used it up all today, baby. And then, then, so what kind of world do you really want to live in? In Hinduism, they tell you it's all about, you know, destroying the ego. Well, why would you be given an ego in the first place? Just to simply destroy it, or maybe to find balance. You know, if if I 
if I held a box, just a, a, a plain brown box in front of you that had a thousand puzzle pieces in it, and I asked you to pull out one piece of that puzzle, could you tell me what the puzzle is? No, you can't, because you need to to look at all the other pieces. Can you really define a brick wall by simply looking at a single brick? What would an eternal being do to pass time through eternity? These are questions you have to ask yourself. Yes, there is a creator. I can't define it for you. I can't define it for no one but myself. But you know one thing I do know? There's something greater than me. Yeah, now let me tell you about the ayahuasca. Because that was a pivotal moment. And then we'll be done. So I go to the, the Solta ceremony. And the first night I'm, I'm not really, really feeling good. Because I rode a bus for two days. And I don't sleep well on a bus. And I was feeling a bit nauseous. So I didn't drink very much ayahuasca that night, and I was a bit skeptical and stuff, and felt maybe I, I was falling into a scam of some sort. But with the little bit that I drank that night, I, I could feel a difference. I could feel my breath and my mind stealing, and, and I, I knew it was the real deal. So so I, I sleep in the man's teepee that night, and then the next day I'm looking around his land to find a place to pop my tent. And so I'm looking, I'm looking for uh, a tree, pretty much, that I can put my tent under that will provide me shade pretty much all day. And I come across an apple tree. <laughs> an apple tree, right? That's that's what they usually like to symbolize uh, the forbidden fruit as, is an apple. So, so I put my tent under the apple tree and I do I do my, my shots and stuff. I didn't drink enough water. When you do ayahuasca, it's important to drink water. And it's also important not to eat too soon after your last shot. Uh, after my third shot, I ate too soon. And believe it or not, the first thing I decided to eat was a slice of apple. <laughs> well, as I was chewing on that apple, the DMT flooded from my gallbladder into my system. And I knew, I knew I had to go lay down because, because I, I could feel it hitting. So I took my chair with my, my plate on it, and I went and laid down, and, and by the time I got there, it was just all white in my mind, and I was saying, fuck, oh God, fuck, fuck, because I knew, I knew what was beginning to happen, I could not stop, I had no control over, and that's, that's when the devil came to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is where a lot of people get freaked out, right, the devil, well, you got to understand something. The only devil that there really is, is, is that darkness that we harbor in our own hearts and we let manifest out of ourselves. Hmm. But, 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 you know, it's, it's that thing about the log in your eye. We, we like to see the devil in everybody else, but we sure don't like to see the one that's in us, do we? Eh, no. No, it's, it's way more interesting looking at the devil in that guy over there than paying attention to the devil in me. See, that's the only fight of evil that you have, is that evil that's in you. What control do you have over me or anybody else? But yet you're going to try to live my life for me, right? Hey, you don't have to answer for anybody but you. So you might want to stick to your business and get your life where it's at. Now, let me leave you with, with, with this. I told you a little bit about the Bible and, and sometimes having to reject a few things. Now, I think there's tests in that Bible because, because you know, if you really believe this about me, how can you believe that? And the Bible is really all about how we treat our fellow man, really. And, and it, it describes a world of cause and effect. We get what we give out. I lost my point. Oh, yes, yes. The prodigal son. Jesus, when he tells the stories to people, he, he uses symbology. Because you got to realize the people that he's talking to are illiterate. They can't read. They can't write. 
And you can bet Jesus doesn't expect on running into these folks again. You get it? It's like a one-time deal. So I'm going to give you the whole deal right now. And I'm not going to give you part of it and then say, Hey, dude, there's somebody going to be coming around later. Look you up to fill you in on the rest of the story. That's not how Jesus works. Jesus, Jesus is giving them the whole, the whole deal. So let's look at the prodigal son for a minute. All right. And he uses the symbology in the prodigal son for a very big reason. You have a, you have a rich son, right? And he asks for his inheritance. Stop for a second. How do you usually get your inheritance from your father? That's right. He fucking kicks the bucket. <laughs> so this kid is asking his live dad for his inheritance, pretty much saying, you're dead to me. And he goes and blows it. And then he finds himself in the worst place he could with the pigs. Now, you're going to have to consider one important fact. At what point in time was the father condemning the prodigal son? Well, prodigal, he, he's sitting there going, well, I've sinned against my father. Father ain't said nothing. And he says, dang, the, the servants at my father's house get treated better than I do. Maybe if I go beg my father, he'll let me be a servant. So you see, prodigal was condemning himself, no one else. Then when he finally decides to get up off his ass and drag his ass home, check it. You gotta ask yourself, at what point in time did prodigal have to sacrifice a fattened calf, pour a bucket of blood over his head to be justified, or have anyone intercede for him? Ooh. No one interceded for the prodigal son. The prodigal son never poured a bucket of blood over his head, and he never had to sacrifice anything to become acceptable to his own father. In fact, as his father saw him from a distance, he sent servants out to rush him back to, to bathe him and give him a feast. You know, dude, dad was pretty much saying, what took you so long, son? I've been waiting for you. But, but you realize the father never held it against the prodigal son. Only the prodigal son and his brother did. Hmm. All forgiving, all merciful, all, all, all! You get it? All knowing. All complete. So if God is all merciful, there can never, ever be a time where you can't get that mercy. It's really all about loving one another. It really is. Stop and think a little bit. Namaste.